or 17 and 18, yeah.
Yes. We're waiting for one more person. Nicole. Sophie. Yes. Welcome everybody. Sorry. I want to sound like a robot. Um, we're going to get started here. Um, I think uh, we're going to begin. Yes, that'd be great. Um, and then Nolan is going to be, we're going we're gonna to do some music for a while. And, uh, and then Nolan is going to be speaking tonight. It's going to be really awesome. Um, so yeah, just be, be ready. It's going to be a really good night. This is Natasha. She's from Tent right City. She's going to just open the night up. All right. Father, we thank you.
for who you are, and we thank you that you're with us. Thank you for every good thing that you have in store for us tonight. And we just invite your presence here. Thank you, God. We thank you in advance for this wonderful night. We ask your blessing on the worship team. And we just ask you to speak to us in Jesus' name. Amen. Praise Him, all angels and heavenly hosts, ye armies of heaven, great beings of old. Sun and the moon and the stars in the night, all ye waters that be there above the sky. Forever and ever by his decree. 
kings of the earth and all men, ye princes and judges and rulers of men. Old men and children, young men and maidens, all of the people Established forever and ever by his decree. And in the earth, his name alone is the Lord. Above the earth and the heavens, his glory. Hey, I, I, for by the words he spoke, the heavens were born. Established forever and ever by his decree. This is a, a song I wrote about, I think about 15 years ago. So it's old, it's really old. That's what old people write is old songs. And um, it's about worship and it's about how worship is always a battle. It's a battle because things happen in worship that the devil doesn't like. And so we're gonna go through and we're just gonna worship God no matter what we feel like no matter what's going on in our lives, no matter what's going on in our country, in our world, because he's worthy of it. And it's called Battleground. Exalting you on every side. 
can tell what era I am from. It's a fight to worship, but it's always worth it to worship you. It's always worth it to worship you. It's always worth it to worship you. It's always worth it. it doesn't matter what goes on. This is a song that, um, that I wrote at Leonard's house this last winter down in Fort Mill, South Carolina. And um, it's about a small town. And uh, it's amazing what, just what God can do, you know, with a group of people that are willing to pursue a dream and to to go after the things that he set before them. So the song is called The Middle of Nowhere. us the timber, the concrete and the steel. We found something hidden, yeah, completely real. Deep in the forest where there's never been a sound, we've assembled a small force and we've got, we've got some trees to knock down.
Deep in the forest, far away from all the noise, stands a vast force of men and women, girls and boys. Stout-hearted kin, we were the answer to a call, and we never lost the thing that made us great when we were still small. wrote that song at my house and it's called The Middle of Nowhere. I was explaining to a friend of mine a predicament I had in my life, a really hard situation. And, um, and he said, you know, 
always look for God in every situation, no matter what situation you're in. And, um, and he said God's love is hiding somewhere in that situation. And no matter what's going on, his love is the motive. Whether if, he hasn't, if, if it's a bad situation and it hasn't been fixed yet, it's because God, he's got everything under control. And I was really able to let go of that situation. And, um, and I believe in God that he's going to breathe new life, you know, back into, into my family, uh, into all my kids, that every one of them are going to, uh, the Bible says that if you train up a child when they're young, when they're old, they will not depart from it. So I just believe all my kids will walk with God and, um, and he's going to breathe new life into them. And as he's doing into me and he's doing into a lot of people, Everywhere I go, I was talking to the people this morning. I've, I've been going to Japan for about the last seven years. And every year, I see a little bit more life and a little bit more life and a little bit more life. But this time, I was there a couple of months ago. And it's like, uh, you know, some of the churches we were in were like pretty much standing room only. You know, and the people, you start the worship and they just go after it, you know, it's like, you expect, you know, Japanese people to do like, you know, like this, no, they're like, <laughs> it's really cool, God is breathing new life into the church all over the world, and it's coming to America, I was just at the call in um, um, Ohio, uh, Cleveland, a couple days ago, and, and uh, man, I could just tell, I could just feel God was there. You know, uh, well, I didn't feel it. I could see it. I could see it. I don't, I don't never feel anything, really. So, but I could see God was moving. And I could tell, man, God's really tearing up. He's, he's getting ready to, to cause a revival in America. And we were praying and, and believing for 80 million souls, 80 million people to be saved in America during this revival. Uh, hey, we could ask for more than that, but I think 80 million is a pretty good number. I'll, I'll take 80 million. <laughs> uh, somebody was mad, said, why, did, why didn't you ask for more than that? And I said, well, I, I, that's the number that came to my mind. But God's love is hiding inside of whatever you're going through right now. It doesn't matter. <laughs>
Come now, Lord, do a fresh wind from heaven. Fill our lungs again, God, with the worship, with the wind that came in the upper room, God, with fire resting on our heads, God, with water coming out of our bellies, Lord, with new vision, God, for our country, for our children, for our marriage, oh, for our cities, God, for our churches, Lord, for our government, Lord, bring it back to life where we see it, God, we see it, we see it like a cloud, the size of a man's hand coming in the distance and Covering this land, I see it coming, I see it coming, I see it coming again. It's a new Jesus movement, it's a new time of refreshing, it's a new river flowing, it's a new spring springing up, spring up. Oh, well, inside of us, spring up, oh, well, inside of us, spring up, oh, well, inside.
trying to keep us from our dreams. Unstop the ancient wells, God. No. Unstop the ancient wells. Come again in your power, in your glory, in your worship, in your head.
Mercy triumphs over judgment Cause you delight in showing mercy 
And mercy triumphs over judgment And you delight in showing mercy And mercy triumphs over judgment Oh yes, you delight in showing mercy Cause mercy triumphs over judgment Lord. Can you just stand up with me uh, for a second? And um, (laughs) everyone's like, no. (laughs) Do you mind standing up with me for a second? I just want to thank you. (laughs) I'm like, I'm not sure if I spoke English. (laughs) Did that come out in tongues? (laughs) Did we need interpretation? Thank you. It's just power and unity. Um, This is not my word, but I'm going to share it in a second. But um, I just want to give you one little word just to put in your head, and it's this word with, with. You can even say that, with, with. And that word is the difference between false religion and real Christianity. When Jesus came, they said his name shall be called Emmanuel, which means God with us. You see, what religion will tell you, and it's a partial truth, is all the things you have to do for God. Live for God, do this for God, and that's very true. But here's the other side that religion won't tell you. You can't do any of those things for God unless God's with you. Christianity is not primarily about what we do for God, though we are called to do great things for God. Christianity is relationship, God with us. God with us. You know why people were being healed in the early church? Because God was with them. You know why? Because fire came and God was with them. Even if they're walking through the shadow, the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil because thou art with me. That phrase, with, God wants to be with us. With. And uh, he is with us. But there's more of his presence. And until we're in that place uh, of the fullness of his presence, we should be longing for more of God. He longs for more of you and more of me to be with him, to open up. And we must long for more of him to be with us. You know, it says the heavens, when Solomon dedicated the temple, he said, the highest heavens and this earth couldn't even contain you. How much less this temple I'm building. But nonetheless, he said, here we are, God. Come be with us. And it says that God came down in fire and glory. God with them. God with them. And and, and Paul said to the Corinthians, even when unbelievers come in your midst, they should stand amazed and say, well, God is with them. So I want you, if you're comfortable to do this, uh, to let's lift our hands. We're going to invite the Holy Spirit, more of God, just to come and flood this place. God with us. That's what revival is. God with us. God, we just come to you and we say we want more of you, more of you with us. Pour out your spirit even more today. Come and be with us. Be with each and every one of us. You were a God who was with sinners and saints and young and old. You want to be with all of us and not just with me, with us, the God with us, the us, the calm, the, the, all of us together. So as we're here together, we're with one another. God, we just welcome each one who's here, and we pray that this would feel like family. They'd feel a part of us, with us. And God, more than that, though more than even welcoming one another, we just want to welcome you, Jesus. We want to welcome you, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Come and flood this even more, and do all that you want to do tonight. Say all that you want 
want to say, heal people, deliver people. And that all comes not because we try and make it happen. Those aren't things we do for you. Those are things you do for us because you're with us. And so, God, we know revival is a relationship. And so come and be with everyone. Be in their low places. Be in their high places. Be in our sitting and our standing and our celebrating. Be with us in the preaching. Be with us in the, you've been with us in the worship. Be with us. God with us. And so we welcome you and say, whatever you want to do, have your way. God, we just open up to you. Have your way in Jesus' name. And everyone says amen. And give a little shout to the Lord. I just want to encourage you, though, to open up the cage. You know, there, one of my favorite uh, authors, uh, Charles Spurgeon, he said, sometimes Christians are like, uh, people who like to go to the zoo, <laughs> and we like to look at animals in the safety of the zoo, you know? And then we go home, and we said, oh, we just saw some wildlife, and he said, but well, nobody really wants a lion loose in their midst, you know? It's safe behind the bars and the cages. So we like to read about the Holy Spirit in the book of Acts. We like to read about those things, but what if Jesus really came into our midst, so the Spirit really came? And I want to encourage us tonight to just be open. Be open more than you've ever been. It says, swing wide the gates that the king of glory could come in. And I'm not saying that God's not with us. He is. But I know there's so much more, and I'm hungry for more. So I just want to encourage you to be open to the fullness of God to come in and to abide with us. That's what he wants. He said, come abide with me, and I'll abide with you. Amen. Thanks. Here you go, Peter. Yeah, this is going to be something else. Uh, we're going to get Nolan up here in just a little bit. Nolan's from uh, Abbotsford, British Columbia. And uh, we're going to have you come back here in just a couple minutes. And uh, our musicians were awesome tonight, weren't they? Give them a hand tonight. Leonard Jones is here from Fort Mill, South Carolina. And we just so appreciate Leonard. And uh, these meetings have just been phenomenal. We started on Thursday night. Uh, we had Adam Cates here from uh, the big house in uh, Virginia Beach, uh, Virginia. He left last night, but he left with a left a powerful message with us last night, and it was really awesome. And um, I'm going to call upon uh, one of our awesome young couples from the ministry here. And they're going to share a little, just a little bit about their life, and then they're going to receive our offering tonight. And then we're going to have Nolan come up. He's going to preach to us. Uh, it's just going to be amazing. There'll be some ministry going on uh, during his uh, preaching, I'm sure. But also afterwards, there may be some personal ministry, some people that want to be prayed for. And so we're really excited about that. Tomorrow morning, we're going to be back here at 10 o'clock. I think Nolan, Nolan's going to speak in the morning too, aren't you? Okay, yeah, tomorrow, tomorrow morning, tomorrow night. And so 10 o'clock tomorrow morning. Six o'clock tomorrow night, we're going to have an amazing time uh, as a, the culmination of this uh, four-day event comes to a close. It's going to be an awesome time in the presence of the Lord. So I'd just like to call on Kyle Davis and Leah, his, you know, his beautiful wife. If you want to come up too, Leah, you can. Maybe after? Okay. Hey, I'm so glad you're doing this. I'm really excited about it. Hello. My name's Kyle W. Davis. Uh, w. Um, what's that? Yes, I am neighbors to these folks. Um, Pete asked for me to share a little bit of my story uh, regarding uh, off, uh, just business stuff and uh, relating to offering. Um, and I guess I'm just going to touch on a, on a testimony. Um, you know, throughout a lot of my entrepreneurial life, um, I'm the kind of I'm the kind of guy that can really obsess about an idea or a project or a product, and I can get so ridiculously obsessed that I just would that that's that was my god, you know, like this project, this idea, th there's there's I got to figure it out, got to work on it, got to work on it, got to work on it, you know, day after day, month after month, and you know, and, and, and God, God took second place, you know. And, uh, and I always wanted to be this person, though, throughout all of it. I always wanted to be that guy that could give, that could give, but not only give, but give big. But these projects would always 
the obsession of the project or the obsession of the idea would always clench my pocketbook. You know, oh, I, c I can't give any money because I got to get this thing going. I can't give any money because I got to get that going. And just years and years and years would go by, and uh, it was about, what's that? <laughs> Not that old. But, uh, you c well, don't let the haircut fool you. Um, it was around the time when we moved the St. Paul house, I came to a, a moment in my life where I, I just was tired of, of being that guy, just clenched pocketbook, not, you know, always having an excuse on why not to give, just always coming up with something that could justify whatever in my own brain, and uh, uh, something came about, and I was able to give, and I said, the heck with this, I'm going to give, and I'm going to give big. Just blow out my savings account, just give it all, let her rip, right? And that was such a huge turning point, point in my life from an entrepreneur and a business guy that, you know, it, it, just, it, just, it just freed me to be a more, just a, a, a more generous person, a, a, a more confident person in the, in the business industry. And it just led, because of that freedom, I was able to operate in, in so many more different gifts that now bigger projects are coming on. You know, I, we're, we're building a hotel next summer. We're I built, doing this huge commercial building in, in, in Wadena, remodeling it. Hopefully some really awesome projects are coming out of that. And I'm still, and, and still able throughout all of it to give, and not only give, but to give big. And, uh, you know, I, I, I'm just telling you right now, if, if, you, got, if you guys are, if, if you're struggling with covetous, you know, being Covetous? Covetousness? Covetous? Sure, we'll go with covetous. <laughs> Giving big frees you from covetousness. <laughs> it does. It legitimately does. Having greed, you know, you know, like, I always wanted to be that guy, oh man, look at that BMW, you know, like, oh, I should get one, I need to get one of those, you know, and just, when you, when you get into that position of your heart to give big, it frees you from all that garbage. Who gives a crap? <laughs> you know, at the end of the day, a, you cannot bring your BMW to heaven. <laughs> You cannot bring your savings account to heaven. And, uh, and, and I believe, I, I believe it, it, in all honesty, the, the Bible when it says, you know, if you give, God will give you, you know, a hundredfold back. But I, you know, it, to me it doesn't always, it doesn't give back in how you always expect it to. To me, uh, I, to me, my number one belief is, you know, if you give a hundred, uh, a dollar, are you going to get a hundred backs magically in your bank account? You know, not all the time. I, well, put it this way, I'm not going to put it past God, right? I'm not going to put it past him, right? But the biggest thing, the biggest return, in my honest opinion, is the legacy it will leave for your children. Okay? All these little kids all over the place, you know, they're watching us. You know, and they're especially watching mom and dad. And if you set an example for your children to be a giver, both in time and in, in money, they will, they will absorb that. And God willing, they take that and, and run with that. And that leaves a legacy. I want to leave a legacy for my sons to say, you can give whatever your heart wants and everything's going to be just fine you don't have to worry you don't have to strive give and give the heck out of whatever you have and love every minute of it and it will bring you so much joy and it'll be something you can hang your hat on you know you can say i did that i helped that i did that 
And that gives you, that gives you more joy and that gives you more confidence even in the workplace. To be able to give big, now you're back in the workplace and you've got that confidence and you can make more projects and you can make more deals. To be able to give even more next time. So that's something that, you know, in the last few years that has really uh, worked well for me is to just, sometimes you got to say, you know, shut up brain and cut the check. Um, so thank you, Lord, for, for everything you've done, Jesus. We just pray over the offering, Lord, and we just, um, I just break any spirit of greed. J Jesus, I break the spirit of envy and strife, and I just pray financial blessings over every individual in this room, Jesus. I just prophesy that everything that their hands touch, Jesus, turns to gold, Lord. That they have faith to operate in confidence and in joy. Jesus, thank you so much. A amen. Okay, so we're going to receive our offering right now, and then we're going to bring Nolan up here to share the word of God with us. So let's just, we, we, we usually, uh, what we do is we bring our offering to the front. Larry's a great example of, uh, of uh, how we do that. And uh, so, thank you, Lord. I think that, I do believe that our musicians are coming back. Is that a possibility that our musicians are coming? Well, I know Jesus... <laughs> I know Jesus is coming back, Leonard. <laughs> yeah, if Christ, if, if Christ isn't raised, we are most miserable, it says in the word, right? Yeah, he was raised, and therefore we shall be raised. So, um, But I, I do believe that our musicians are coming back tonight. We'll just see, how, see what the Holy Spirit has for us during this time when uh, Nolan's sharing the word. So give him a hand. Uh, what do you, you got? Okay, yeah. We got to change batteries in the mic. That's what we got to do real quick. So, um, the fire starters and I have CDs over here. Uh, I brought uh, a couple of my anthology packs, which are pretty much everything I've recorded for about the last 35 years. I even have four songs on there. About 25 years ago, I formed a band with a couple of guys from a group called Leonard Skinner. They went through a plane crash and a couple of the guys got saved and, and, and we, uh, we formed like a Southern Rock Jesus group. And uh, So I even put a couple of those, uh, four of those songs on that. It's, it's pretty much everything I want you to hear. Uh, I recorded a lot more than that, but I do not want anybody to hear it, even God, so I've destroyed it. Uh, it might be there in heaven waiting. But anyway, um, so I have uh, CDs over there. Firestarter's got some great CDs over there. And I, it's, um, I mean, like, I ha that, that CD pack has 14 CDs in it, and it's, uh, there are about 70 minutes on every CD. So it's, I, it's kind of, uh, what do you call it? Pirated. I, I took my own CDs and pirated, and pirated it with my own CD. So it's kind of legal in a way. Uh, and just made just compilations of all these songs that I've written throughout the years. And uh, just something, you know, a lot of my songs just talk about, you know, the faithfulness of God. Yeah. You know, I've been saved now, I got saved basically in 1971, you know, and uh, I've just seen just God just being faithful just throughout my whole life, you know, and, and, uh, and I've just, I've learned to trust him even when it just doesn't look like, you know, it, it's going to happen. And I do get sad sometimes, yeah. but, but at the same time, I'm, I have a hope. I always have a hope inside of me. Yeah. And so a lot of those, a lot of the songs where I have that in there, like, you know, hey, I'm going through all this stuff, like King David. Yeah, you know? King it's David. like, man, I just hate all this stuff. You know, but you're so awesome. So that's a lot of my songs are like that. And there's a lot of different styles, like rock and jazz and Love it. bluegrass and everything. 
You ready, Nolan? I'm ready, man. <laughs> Thank you. I'm going to open this water bottle before because if I've not told you a story, you know, sometimes we have embarrassing moments. And I remember I was actually, uh, I was preaching one time, I was actually in Bethel, uh, in, in, in Redding, California, and I was like, oh, I was all nervous, and I felt like I was in my flow preaching, and I was like really thirsty and dry, so I thought I didn't want to stop my flow, you know, and I couldn't get the lid off of the bar water bottle, I didn't want to put the mic down, so I had this brilliant idea to put it between my legs and just keep preaching, but I was squeezing the water bottle between my legs to hold it from falling as I took the top off, so it baptized my whole jeans area here, so I won't do that this time, so I'm going to open this. But, uh, <laughs> yeah, I just felt I need to share that with you. Do you guys feel edified? <laughs> That's awesome. Um, hey, I'm just going to share, I wasn't going to share this, but I'm going to share just a little bit of a testimony of mine, just a little condensed version that might explain me a little bit. <laughs> and um, because I know I'm a little bit of a different <laughs> personality, we're all different, right? We're strange creatures. <laughs> but, um, I, you know, I was never raised in the church. You know, I was, and I, I, nobody, none of my friends who I grew up with uh, ever could imagine, even in their wildest imaginations, that Nolan would, would number one, be a Christian, <laughs> be a follower of Christ, but number two, never be, be a minister. And I've been a minister now for about 20 some years ministering. And, um, but the other thing that I've been involved in for many years is. Is, is fighting. <laughs> and it's a bit of a strange paradox for some people. And I don't mean fighting like I'm not going out on the streets uh, picking random fights. And th that's, not <laughs> that's, that's not what I'm talking about. But the sport. I've always been involved in two kinds of sports growing up. Team sports, which I really deeply believe in because it teaches us to win and lose together. You know, I really believe in team sports. That's a plug for putting your kids in team sports because, uh, you know, life sometimes you lose, but you got to play your best and you got to win or lose together. And sometimes you win and you need to. So I think there's something beautiful in team sports. You know, we, we, we got to stick it out. We got to fight it out. We got to all play our best and be doing our best. And when I play team sports, I just wanted to always give my best. And the only time I get frustrated with someone on my team is if they at some point just kind of quit. You know, they're on the field, like, I don't care anymore. I'm like, come on, man. Like, just put your best in it. And uh, so that's influenced me all the time in the church. I'm like, come on, I just want everybody playing their part, whatever the part is, because we all have different parts in teams, whether it's basketball or hockey or football. And I played all kinds of team sports. But we need everybody. You know, every single one of you, whatever age you are, you're part of the team. And uh, I'm so thankful for the different gifts. Like, I'm amazed and touched by Leonard, your, your ministry and your music. It's the first time we've been able to uh, be together ministry and it touched me and Adam and others and just even the whole community of all that you guys are and do it's so I'm so inspired by this community really and I know Adam said this last night but I want to affirm this as I travel around this is one of my favorite places and one of my most I just think incredible people and I don't know sometimes if you always know that but you really are an incredible team so I want to encourage you as a team you know in your families and in your church community man be for one another and Satan has a fear of teamwork you know and that's why he tries to bring division all the time because we need to have each other's backs and so I was in team sports but I was also always an individual individual sports, wrestling, boxing, uh, martial arts, and my stepdad was, a, was in the military and he got me boxing, uh, right, that was my first love, he started me boxing grade four and then I got into, uh, I, I got into um, martial arts and I went into high school wrestling and the reason I loved individual sports is because sometimes, as you know, we're all fighting some kind of fight, we really are, in some of your greatest fights, you actually feel very alone, like David was in the cave and he had to fight that kind of alone. God's with you, but sometimes your greatest battles, you're fighting alone. Jesus going off into the wilderness and fighting Satan alone. And so I always tell people, you know, this is not me trying to encourage you all to take up boxing. <laughs> I'm just saying individual uh, sports. For me, individual combat uh, was really important, but I never would ever see myself, you know, being a minister. So, so I, you know, I was, I was always, and when you're in competition, by the way, here's another little plug for parents. Uh, if you have those kind of rowdy kids, some of you got the rowdy boys, you know, I love, in, or maybe rowdy girls. <laughs> um, 
combat sports are really good for them, and some people worry, you know, if you put your kids in combat sports, aren't you promoting violence? I remember one time the CBC radio uh, interviewed me because I had uh, I'd won a gold medal for Western Canada in martial arts, and I was a minister, and they gave me the nickname, you know, the minister. And so CBC Sports said, how can you be a minister and like a fighter? Like, don't you think you're promoting violence? And, and I said, no, it's not violence, because uh, violence always has a victim. I, I said, you know, and, and so if it's on the streets, you're beating someone up, you know, and you're being a bully, that's violence. You, you have a victim. But I said, when two people say, hey, we're going to wrestle, there's no victims. We're both enjoying this as refs, as sports. We shake hands after. In fact, I'll tell you this. I, in the martial arts, in boxing, in wrestling, I found greater community, to, if I'm honest, <laughs> and maybe I shouldn't be this honest, than I almost even found anywhere in the church. Sometimes I thought, I wish I could teach the church the brotherhood that I learned in martial arts, because this is what I learned in martial arts. I mean, I literally competed at the highest level, fought for Canadian belts, and uh, I said, you know, you have this stare down. So, you know, someone stand up and stare me down. You've got to stand up here, bro, and stare me down. So, so you know, you, you do your little stare down, and you, a lot of it's just, you're, they're your friends, but you've got you to sell the fight, so you're having to stare down. And you, and you have this little combat, whatever it is, kickboxing or wrestling, but then when it's all over, you know, you shake hands. You're like, win or lose, hey, that was a good fight, and it's all over. You left it in the cage or in the ring or on the wrestling mats. So it's all over. That person's still your friend. And I said, I wish I could teach the church that uh, because sometimes church wars, you know, I, would, I pastored for many years, and I'd see people get in church fights, and then they're, like, mad at each other for, like, 20 years. And I'm like, it'd be better for you guys to get in the boxing ring. Can I put on two gloves on you? You guys can duke it out and then shake hands after and just stop being mad at each other for 20 years. So I actually sometimes joke that I to take a break from the violence of ministry, I uh, entered into martial arts <laughs> because it was so much more like peaceful. <laughs> but, but there's a real actually truth to that. Um, so I'd done that all the time when I was younger. You know, I'd been in, 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 in kind of uh, combat sports and then Christ got a hold of me. He, Christ grabbed a hold of my life and called me to follow him and called me to be a minister. And uh, I left everything kind of to do that. It was like Peter leaving your fish nets. I'm going to follow him. And then about uh, maybe 10 years ago, kind of all hell broke loose in my life. And I was like, kind of like Peter, I'm going back fishing. <laughs> and I'm just going to go back into martial arts. It's much easier, you know, instead of fighting. Like, you know, Paul says we don't fight against flesh and blood, right? The principalities and the powers and the rulers of the dark forces of this age. And I was like, I just want to fight some flesh and blood. It's easier. We just get it out. We shake hands. We hug it off. These principalities and powers, they're just, oh, I'm, I'm so I just said I'm going fishing. Or I'm going fighting, Lord. And, uh, and uh, you know, it was, it was uh, I, I got to compete at the highest level, for, um, but I, I could feel when God started to lift his, like it almost like, I felt like Samson all of a sudden, like my strength would leave me when I'd go in, I'm like, I'd, something would happen, I'd get sick right before, and he just stopped blessing me, in it. and it's not because I, combat sp sports are bad, this is my plug for combat sports, um, but it's because he was like, Nolan, I've called you, you know, not to be a, not to be a, just a, a fighter, but a fighter for man, like, like when he said to Peter, no, you know, come back, leave your nets again. I've called you to be a fisherman. He says, you are a fighter. I've made you a fighter. But I want you to fight for people, and I want you to fight spiritually. And, and, and uh, so I, you know, retired from that and left. And I kept coaching for a bit. But, uh, but I really just, uh, th there's something inside of me that is a fighter. But I, I want to encourage you that, and I said this, I think that then I'm a fighter because I'm a lover. And uh, I fight for people because I believe we have an enemy of our soul. And, I, and I, know, I know who my enemy is. And see, I'll tell you the honest truth. When I came to Christ, it was because before Christ revealed himself to me, I didn't believe in God and I didn't believe in the devil. I thought it was the most ridiculous thing ever that people believed in the God and the devil. I thought it was all made up and people just did that. And I was like, whatever, you can have that. But I was like, I believed in the science. <laughs> That's from, uh, never mind. <laughs> yeah, I believed in the science, which I still do believe in the science. <laughs> I, yeah. <laughs> That's nacho. Um, I still do believe in the science, but Christ showed me the reality of the spirit world. But how I came to Christ was actually was through a manifestation of the devil. That I was a little bit of the bad boy at that time, you know, 18, 19. And there was a group who were, who were into occult stuff. And I just thought it was all ridiculous. And they thought, well, Nolan's kind of a bad boy, and he's kind of like a, so he would be into it. And so there was this whole kind of initiation thing sort of planned for me. 
and uh, I, I had a full manifestation of the enemy before me. And, but what happened was it actually backfired on the devil. I was like, oh my gosh, there is a devil. Like I did not believe there was a devil. And I, I saw and felt the power of it, and I saw like the reality of it, and I saw things that I just thought were things like, I still, ha I don't even tell people some of the things I saw because I lived it and I have a hard time believing it, so I thought people probably won't believe it. So I don't even really tell people that, but what happened was it backfired on the devil because I was like, you know, there had been horrible things that happened, like we all have brokenness in our lives. There had been brokenness in my childhood and, you know, divorce a few times on each side and even loved ones that I know had suffered and experienced abuse. And so I'd become a fighter kind of for that because when I was a little kid, I wasn't strong enough to always protect those that I loved. And I thought, no one's going to hurt someone I love uh, anymore. I'll, I want to be able to protect my sisters, my mom, my family, my friends. And so I trained myself so that at least with my hands and feet <laughs> and knees and elbows and whatever else, <laughs> that I would be able to protect those that I love against any enemy that wanted to hurt my family. And then I saw this being show itself that I didn't believe in. And I was like, oh. There is a devil. And I instantly knew, I'm like, wait a minute, you are my enemy. You're the one who's been hurting families and friends. And you may use people, you may manipulate and deceive people. And, and you know, I've been battling flesh and blood. But I'm like, you're the power, the principal. You're my enemy. And so it kind of backfired. Satan thought that I'd probably be like into that, but I, I decided that was my sworn enemy. And so kind of since that moment, he is, I have an, I have an intense love for God. But not far below my intense love for God is an intense hatred for evil and what it does to people. But the reason I'm a fighter is because I'm a lover. You know, the Bible says love must be sincere. And then the next verse says, it's Romans 12, love must be sincere. What does sincere lo love look like? Hate what is evil and cling to what is good or fight for what is good. And if you love what's good, then you have to hate what's evil. And so I don't want to see evil hurt people. I don't want to see evil harm children. And, and, uh, and so I fight, fight for people. And, uh, and, and but so God said, come back and just give yourself, you know, to ministry and just fight, fight, fight for people. And so, so I do that. Um, but I was telling you about that CBC thing. They said, don't you worry that that's uh, promoting uh, violence and a victim. I said, no, you know, when I played football, it never made me want to randomly, like, tackle people. <laughs> I didn't walk down the street and go, oh, you know, football is promoting tackling, so I'm just going to randomly tackle someone at Walmart. <laughs> I said, in the same way in boxing, you know, if, if you're a wrestling coach, and this is just for those parents who wonder, should you ever put your, it's the greatest thing if your kids have some of those issues, because if you have a true coach, a martial artist, a wrestling coach, a boxing coach, he'll tell you, if he ever hears you bullying, you'll be off the team, you'll be bent, like, it belongs only, you know, we tell people sport, fitness, and self-defense, and, and that's all. If it's used for any other thing, a true coach will, will shut you down. And the other thing I told the CBC reporter, and I said, and I said, Christians who have a problem with that kind of thing, I said, it's only because they actually don't know their Bible. I always thought it was funny because sometimes the religious spirit gets offended, you know, oh, you're a, you know, oh, how can you box and do this? And I said, like, do you even know your Bible? You're, you're offended that, I'm, that I box, but you teach your kids about a young guy named David who cut someone's head off. I said, I've never cut somebody's head off. <laughs> so I'm like, how can you, like, you know, how do you read all these scriptures and then, and then like, kind of, like, emasculate the idea of Christianity so a man can't be a man and, and do combat? Anyway, that's just a little side note. <laughs> but, um, but... But it should always be for love. God looks at the heart, for, you know, and, and, and for love. And so we always would teach people. And I said, plus, by the way, I'm just trying to be like God. And I don't know if you know this, but God uh, is an incredible, he's an incredible mixed martial artist. He really, he really is. He's a master in both realms. And mixed martial arts is, is a combination of striking, you know, where you use your, your hands, your knees, your kicks, your elbows. That's the striking element. And it's a com and grappling with wrestling, whatever it's jujitsu or sambo or, you know, but it's submission wrestling. And God does both of those so great. I, like, God has struck people down. He even, like, he struck Saul blind. If someone hits you hard enough that you're blind for three days, <laughs> you know, that's a good strike. So God did that to, to save Saul for a good reason. He's like, you're going the wrong way. You're doing the wrong thing. And it's enough, boy. And it says, boom, power hit him. And he's on his, he got knocked off his donkey, <laughs> knocked off his uh, donkey, and um, <laughs> or onto his donkey. <laughs> he got knocked onto, off his donkey and onto his behind. <laughs> and, uh, but God's also a great grappler. I said, like, so people be like, oh, but you grapple. And if you know grappling, by the way, 
Grappling is submission grappling. And so what it's based on is there's a saying you have like tap, which means you submit, right? Or yeah, that's right. Or you snap or you choke out. That's what it means. So, so if I lock the lock on, I'm going to use you again here. <laughs> so here, I'll, I'll just do this and bring, bring the mic up here. So, so, so say I got a lock on. If I start cranking it, and if he doesn't, ta if he doesn't tap, his arm will break, but it's only his, at this point, it's only his pride that's going to stop him. All he has to do in a submission is just tap out. So just, just tap out. <laughs> and, uh, and, I said, and I said, God actually was a great submission grapple. You know the story when God came down, the angel of the Lord, and he wrestled Jacob? Wrestled him all night. God wrestled him all night, and Jacob said, I'm not letting you go. And so God said, what happens if you don't submit, you don't tap out? You snap, and God broke his hip, and Jacob walked with a limp. So I always tell people, in all your fighting, here's one person you should never, ever fight, because it's the only undefeated fighter is God. And uh, so anyway, that's my little explanation of no one as the fighter, as the martial artist, and the minister. But that's not my message, but I thought I'd share that with you, just so you understand some of the madness inside of my brain. Thank you. But, but really, I, I spend my life, I give myself, my hero, one of my heroes of the Old Testament is David. And I love David because, you know, people sometimes want to kind of pigeonhole you. I wasn't raised in a church, so when you, it's like, well, how, if you're a minister, how come you don't look like a minister? You know, you have tattoos, you don't wear a suit, you know, how, you don't, you, how, you, how can you do boxing? And I was like, and sometimes they, people can put you in a little box, like a little cookie cutter, a little religious cookie cutter. But I'd, I'd read the scriptures, and I'm like, well, Jesus, you chose, like, real men's men and a real mixture of people from disciples and fishermen and all these things. And I read about David. I'm like, wait a minute. David was a man after your heart, and uh, he didn't have to choose between being a lover right? He was a lover of God. He'd pour out his soul. He'd, he was, he'd write poetry. So being a man doesn't mean, you know, like, he'd literally, psalms are poetry and songwriting and, and very emotional. And I, I have that side. I'll weep openly and I don't, you know, but I'll, I'll fight if I need to fight. And David was a warrior. David was a fighter. So never, never divide what God's joined together. Ne you know, never think, like, Jesus himself is both the lion and the lamb. Is there two more opposite creatures in the kingdom that, you know, in, in the natural kingdom that, than a lion and a lamb? There isn't, but God, Jesus is both of them. We, we have a wildlife park in Kamloops where I used to live, and you go there and you can see all kinds of lions or bears and all that. And then they have this one little area that's a petting zoo, and that's where they put the lambs so the kids can go pet the lambs. But they never put lions in the petting zoo. And I'm not sure why. <laughs> Probably because lions aren't quite as safe for kids to pet. And uh, Jesus is both those sides. It's so, there's paradoxes in the kingdom. He's a lamb. He's gentle. He's meek. He's lowly. He's humble. He's the safest, most sensitive man you'll ever meet. That like sinners felt welcomed in him. Like he is a prote he's just like children. Anybody can come to him. There's nobody safer than Jesus. And yet his face could change. And he was a lion. Table tipping. You know, strong enough to stop a mob that's going to, you know, kill a woman. And he could back them all off. I mean, he's a man's, he's a lion. I mean, why did they crucify him? Because he was shaking the systems. He was too strong. He's, he was dangerous. So I'm, that's my little plug just to say, do not divide what God's joined together. Th that's a whole other theme. That's maybe one of the first books I want to do is called Divine Tensions because I, I hate when people say this. Now I'm going on a rant. See where you started? <laughs> but I'll tell you this. I, I hate this when people say things like, do you ever hear this saying? It's not about this. It's about that. Like, it's not about, it's not about, it's not about the fear of the Lord. It's just about the, the love of the Lord. And I'm like, well, how come Jesus spoke about both? You know, or it's not, like, how, like, why do you have to divide this? Like, like a rainbow doesn't go, it's not about yellow. It's about orange. It's like, no, it's about yellow and orange and red and blue. And God is all the attributes. It's all goodness in him. It's not from corruption. So he is everything, lion and lamb, justice and mercy, you know, spirit and truth. So don't divide things that God's joined together. Okay, let's pray. <laughs> let's pray. Let's pray. Because I need to actually share my word. But that just kind of got me excited because those are things that are passionate in my heart. Uh, if you have your Bibles, why don't you turn to the Gospel of Mark and the ninth chapter, if you could. And, um, but just before you do that, can I ask you to stretch your hands out towards me? Because I have a great awareness that, that uh, I'm trying to represent Jesus. I want to speak and I want you to encounter Jesus because 
unless Jesus comes through what I say, or unless Jesus' spirit rests on me as I minister, then nothing really of any value is going to really happen here. And, and I know that, you know. And so, so I'd, I want to ask you just to pray for me that Christ would have his way in me. And so, Lord, I just give myself to you. These are your people. I know you greatly love them, that you greatly care about them, and you, you want to speak to them through your word, through by your spirit, but by me, your son, and I just want to serve you. So, God, have your way. Speak clearly. Let everything that's on your heart and your mind come. All that you want to say here in this moment and nothing more, nothing less. And uh, I give myself to you for that. In Jesus' name, everybody said amen. Thank you. So Mark chapter 9, I'm going to read. Uh, and this message is about a Jesus revival. Because, and, and, and I really, but I specifically want you to understand Revival, because here's what happens. I believe we hear words so often that they just become like kind of trite. And, and uh, revival can be one of those things. It's like a great little buzz thing at a conference, but we don't really sometimes understand what the word means. Or maybe when I say revival, you have an image of a certain time in your life. And it might you're right, that probably was an experience of revival. Or maybe some historical revival, a great awakening, uh, the Welsh revival. And those things are all amazing. But I want to take you back a little further to the one who really purely defines revival and uh, who, who calls us all to revival, and that's Jesus. I want you to see who he is, and I want you to be able to uh, also to understand the difference between a revival of Jesus' love and the dangers in the midst of it that we get, we get off into religion. And, and, we, and we get off and we bring our own agendas in. That just happens to all of us because we're human. And we all think we don't. We think we're pretty sure that I'm representing God right and I got his mind and his heart. But the truth is, unless I'm continually coming back to Jesus and allowing him to uh, change my mind, then I'm going to sometimes get wrong thoughts in there. And so I, I want you to come back to the Gospels and look with me. And I want to tell you the gospel saved me. Uh, in these last three, four years, the Gospels. Now, I've been a Christian for over 20 years. I've been ministering for over 20 years, so it's weird to say the Gospel saved me. But I'll tell you, what happens is some people think that the Gospels, and they're like, yeah, we know the Gospels. That's like the kindergarten of Christianity, and then we go on to the meteor stuff. But when they say the Gospel, they kind of mean like, yeah, Christ died for me. Christ rose again, and Christ reigns. And that is the gospel. That's the powerful and uh, life-changing, but that's a part of the gospel. That's at, normally in the end of the four gospels. That's the last few chapters. But what, what's, what's Jesus doing all the other chapters until his crucifixion? He's showing us something of what this thing's about. He's showing us what the kingdom looks like. He's showing us what revival is. And so if you've ever been burned by religion or by people or by your own self, if you've ever like feel like you've gotten jaded, a cynical about Christianity, because I was there, because I've seen the best and the worst uh, of this thing we call church. <laughs> and, uh, and maybe I've, and I'm not saying to be judgmental, maybe I've been the best and the worst of it at times too. But I'm just saying, what saved me was going back to the Gospels. I'm like, oh yeah, I forgot how much I love this guy Jesus. I'm like, oh, I forgot how amazing he is. Oh my gosh, I forgot that some of these ideas that I brought in, didn't really come from the Gospels. And, and Jesus would start not just tipping the tables that I read about. He was starting to tip my tables, but I really liked it because we all want Jesus to set a table for us. But before he sets a table for you, he's got to tip some of the tables that you got already set up. And uh, the Gospels will do that. So that's my plug for you to immerse yourself in the Gospels and get a fresh look at this person of Jesus because that's the only way you and I will change. We're not changed by trying, we're changed by beholding. We're, you know, and the Jesus that you see is the church that you'll be. So if you're not looking deeply at Jesus, then you aren't going to be able to reflect him. And if you have a religious picture of Jesus that isn't quite accurate, you're going to give a religious reflection. If you have an, a bitter picture of I can always I always tell people, I can tell what kind of Jesus you're looking at by what you're reflecting. I'm like, so if, if there's people who have got a really religious picture, I'm like, you're looking at some wrong picture of Jesus. Go back to the Gospels. Or if you've got like a bitter picture of Jesus, I'm like, show me that. Show me the bitter Jesus in the Gospels. I don't see it. So when I look at 
it. I might have bitterness in me because I'm human, but I ha Jesus confronts that and changes that. So that's my plug for don't get away from the Gospels. Don't lose Jesus in this thing we call Christianity. Don't lose Jesus in this thing we call church. And he, he can get lost, you know. He wrote to, I mean, the very first, the first churches, like first century, he wrote to them in Revelation. He goes, hey, man, you guys are doing all kinds of awesome things in your church. Really cool. You got good doctrine, and, you know, it, I, it's, you're doing good stuff. But he goes, uh, I'm, at, I'm actually not at your church right now. He goes, I'm standing at the outside knocking. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. We use that as an evangelistic sermon. It wasn't an evangelistic sermon. It was written to the church. Jesus said, why don't you open up and let me come in? Like, you're doing church for me, but you're not doing it with me. I'm not with you. Why don't you open up and I'll make a table for you and you can sit down and sup with me and I'll sup with you. Are you eating with him? What are you eating? What are you drinking? You know, what, what are you feasting on? We, we called the first church we planted the feast. So this is my plug for a Jesus revival. Mark chapter 9, let's read the story. And I want you to see the picture of revival. And I pray by the Spirit, it so grips you and haunts you that it wakes you up literally in the night. Like it does me to say, oh, because I, you see what happens when you see the real deal? You can't, you will no longer be satisfied with Jesus' light. You know, I don't want it. Like I don't want something less. If, if I see something real, I want to experience the real. I don't want the fake. I don't want the lighter version. I want the real. And I hope that this story does that for you, to put in you a hunger, to taste and see this. And because I, when I read the scripture, by the way, I tell people, it'll do nothing for you. It'll be like going to, unless you put a hunger to experience that. Unless when you read it, you say, yes, Christ, do this in me. Otherwise, you can read it, it won't do nothing. The Pharisees read the scripture, did nothing. I tell people, it's like going to a restaurant, thinking if you read the menu all the time, it'll satisfy you. You're like, and you see, you go there. I go to that restaurant every Sunday. I read this menu. I memorize the menu. I sing songs about the things on the menu. Thank you for the chicken burgers. Thank you for the fries and the iced tea. And then you go, ah, man, it's not really satisfying. I don't even know if I believe in this anymore. And I'm like, that, that's because you're not supposed to just memorize and sing songs about what's on the menu. You're supposed to taste and see. You're supposed to, you have not because you're asked not. You're supposed to read it and go, I want to experience that. And you ask for it. You ask, you have not because you ask not. So when you read this, how you respond to it will decide what you begin to experience and encounter. And I once want to wake in hunger and thirst so that you can say, oh, Holy Spirit, do that in me. Oh, Jesus, show that to me. So that's my desire as I read this to you. Not just to inspire, not just to inform, but I hope to awaken in you a hunger for these things because this is who Jesus really is. And I don't want to be, I don't want just like some lower version. And I'm saying that to me. And I want you to know when I'm preaching, because I'm going to preach my heart out here in a moment, I, I already am, I guess, but I'm preaching to me first. I, I'm not trying to preach down to you. I'm preaching like looking at you. And I'm normally my first one at the altar call, because if I'm preaching on forgiveness, Jesus starts putting in my face people I haven't forgiven. And I'm like, okay, i got to finish this preaching. I'm like, okay, I need to, God, because I don't want to be a hypocrite. I, I, I want to experience these things. And hypocrisy doesn't mean you're not perfect. It just means you're pretending. And I never want to pretend. I, I'd rather authentic imperfection than, uh, than inauthentic perfection. Okay, Mark chapter 9. Jesus said to them, this is Jesus' words, not mine. Jesus said to them, truly, truly. It's like, he's like, this is truth I'm telling you. I say to you, there are some standing here who will not taste death until they see the kingdom of God. After it has come with power, with power. Jesus said, this is what I want you to see. The kingdom of God with power, with power, power, power. The kingdom of God with power. And uh, I'm not satisfied with something less than that. If, he, if this is what he wants me to see, you know, then this is what I want to experience. And so then verse 2 after six days, Jesus took with him Peter and James and John, and he led them up a high mountain by themselves, and he was transfigured, or one gospel says his appearance changed before them, and his clothes became radiant. This is revival. You, you, this is revival, you guys. Jesus bringing the kingdom with power to a community. And by the way, 
Don't we always think revival has to be like thousands of people? Yes, I want to see thousands of people, 3,000 saved on the day of Pentecost. But this was one of the greatest moments in Christianity in the Gospels. And you know how many people were there? Three. So let me tell you something. Don't ever despise small groups or small crowds or small moments because it's small little passionate groups that change the world. Like 12, like three, just three. Anyway, but he took up James, Peter, and John, led them up a high mountain, and he was transfigured. His clothes became radiant, intensely white. Isn't there an intensity in revival? Uh, his clothes became intensely white, as no one on earth could bleach them. And there appeared to them Elijah. Elijah was the prophet of fire, you know? Boom, the guy's bringing fire down. Moses, he's the glory guy, the glory on the mountain, the glory in his face. So Elijah and Moses are there, and they're talking with Jesus. Can, I always tell people, when I read this, try and put yourself there, because you probably read this story a hundred times, but not only to try and, like, like, be on that mountain, figure your legs are tired from climbing there, smell the air, like, try and picture it right now. Like, engage your imagination, engage the text. Like, don't just read Moses and Elijah. Like, think about this. These these are dead guys who were their heroes, and they showed up talking to Jesus. And you're like, can you imagine what you're feeling? You're like, is that really like Moses and Elijah? And like, two, all of a sudden, two dead guys show up, and the guy you've been following, all of a sudden, his face is shining like the sun, and his clothes got like super white. Like, this is like a sci-fi movie. Um, but th there it is, and, uh, and, and they're there talking with Jesus, and Peter said to Jesus, because we get our ideas in revival, right? Hey, I got a great idea, Jesus. <laughs> Jesus didn't even ask him his opinion, but he's like, I got an idea, Jesus. Let's build three churches here. Let's build three tabernacles, you know, because that's what it's really all about. It's just more church buildings. <laughs> Let's make three tents, one for you. You know, you, you get one. We'll even give you the biggest one, Jesus. But we got, let's get one for this guy Moses and Elijah because they look awesome. And he didn't know what to say. For he was terrified. He was terrified. Because if you see a guy whose face starts burning bright and his clothes start burning white and dead guys show up, you're probably going to be terrified too. So, like, if you, you know, we can read the story, and it's like looking at it, the safety. It's what Spurgeon said, looking at a line through the safety of the text. But if you're actually going inside of the cage and you're there, you're terrified too. And, uh, and a cloud overshadowed them. A cloud I always tell people, this is not like a little Care Bear fluffy cloud. This is like the cloud of glory. This is the cloud of like joy, but fear. But, and by the way, let me, this is my plug for, there's a healthy kind of fear. It's like awe and reverence. In fact, I'll tell you the truth. Some of the reason I used to like fighting was because when I felt like a little bit of fear, I felt alive. Why I like jumping off cliffs into water was uh, because I'd feel alive, feeling like a little, bit of, a little bit of healthy fear. Or when I'd be a little kid and I'd watch a storm going off and I was a little kid and I was like, oh, I'm afraid, but I feel so, I feel small. We don't like to feel small. We like to feel big, you know? But I feel small before something bigger than me, a storm. And it was a beautiful feeling, you know? And so there's a healthy fear, and they were feeling this. And the cloud overshadowed, and then a voice comes out of the cloud. Like, whenever God shows up, like, in a burning bush, and a bush starts speaking to you, that's a strange moment. If a cloud comes down, well, maybe a cloud could come on a mountain, but the cloud starts talking to you, this is an unusual moment. And a voice comes out of the cloud and says, this, this is, and this is the message of revival, and we miss it because of its simplicity. We miss it like Peter. We think it's about Moses and Elijah. We think it's about more tents and tabernacles, and he's like, no, it's about Jesus. This is my son, Jesus, and can you believe it? The very first 12 apostles almost missed a moment. Could we miss it? They almost missed what it was about. Can we miss what it's about? Maybe we think it's about building our ministries and our tents. And maybe we think it's about Moses and Elijah or Nolan and somebody else. But it isn't us. Like, God bless Moses and Elijah. They're awesome leaders. But this whole thing's about Jesus and the Father's shouting over them, don't miss what this is about. Don't miss this moment. This is Jesus. Listen to him. And suddenly looking around, they no longer saw anyone but Jesus only. Wow, that's a powerful story. So what is revival? What does revival look like? Hi, Violet. You're so cute. Revival looks like that too, by the way. That's why I love moments like kids walking by, because kids were always going by Jesus all the time in the Gospels. I'm like, oh, that's awesome. Um, what does it look like? What is revival? Here is, I believe, Jesus' definition of revival, and it should be yours. 
It's the kingdom of God on earth with power. Jesus said, I want you to experience the kingdom of God here today on earth with, with power. That's revival. And this needs to be what it's about. Church is so important, but the church is the community of the kingdom. The kingdom does not exist for the church. The church exists for the kingdom. If you don't get the kingdom right, everything else you're going to get wrong. And listen, the, the, the kingdom should be your primary vision, your primary mission, your primary passion. I tell every one of you, I am a revivalist. I'm called to go spread the kingdom message, but so are you. Maybe not like me, maybe very differently, but you're, you're all called to be revivalists. I can't say that on my own authority. Jesus said that if your definition of revival is the kingdom, he said to everyone, seek first the kingdom. What are you supposed to be seeking? The kingdom. Where are you supposed to be seeking it? On earth. What's your primary prayer he taught you? Your kingdom come. Your will be done. Where? On earth. What earth? This earth. Where? In otter tail. In your home. In your family. In the earth. We're all trying to escape the earth, right? We can't wait till Jesus gets back and we'll leave the earth. And Jesus is like, listen, things are all right in heaven. I don't need you up in heaven. You know? Jesus is like, I left heaven to come to earth to bring the kingdom to earth. You're all busy trying to leave the earth to get to heaven. He goes, I got you down here for a mission, for a reason. It's the kingdom of God on earth with power. Power to do what? Power to heal power to change your life. <laughs> if you don't get the kingdom, you, you won't see anything. You'll, you'll do religion and one day you'll get to heaven, but you won't experience anything because it's the kingdom. And you won't even be able to change, by the way, if you don't get the kingdom. Jesus said repent, which means change. That's all the word repent means, change. Jesus said change because the kingdom of heaven's at hand. That was his first message very first thing you preach. Repent. The kingdom of heaven. It's the power to change. Some of you are fighting things, and I've been fighting things, that I go, I'm powerless. That's all right. I embrace my powerlessness. I, I don't have to be powerful. It didn't say change because, you know, no one's at hand. <laughs> no, I'm nothing, and you're nothing, and we can't change much. Apart from me, he said you can do nothing. But there's a power in the kingdom to bring change and transformation and to break chains and to break addictions and to break power, but it's in the kingdom. It's in the kingdom, and, it's, and by the way, the kingdom's touchable. This was the message of Jesus. It, it consumed him, the kingdom of heaven. You know how many times Jesus spoke of church? And I love church. This is not me knocking church. I just want people to understand what the church is. I've, I've, I speak at churches. I planted uh, two churches. I'm probably planting a third one. But people don't get what church is. It's meant to be the community of the kingdom. And uh, people forget about the kingdom, and they just think it's just gathering. And, you know, but I'm like, no, you're the kingdom people. Jesus spoke of church one time. He spoke of the kingdom multiple times. And when he spoke of the church, he said, Peter, I'm going to build my church. And what you're going to need to build my church is what? I'm going to give you the keys of the kingdom. You can't even build the church without the kingdom. Not really, not Jesus' church. You, you need to receive the kingdom, the power. But here's the problem. At church, we become good at hearing. But Jesus said the kingdom of God is at ear. No. He said the kingdom of God's not in word. It's in power. The kingdom of God's at hand. I tell people, look at your hand. That, what does that mean? It means it's touchable. It's near you. It's actually near you. There's actually a power down here. You see, one day I'll get to heaven, I'll touch him. He goes, no, no, no. I came down to be God with you, to bring God touchable. So that when Jesus is walking by, even the fringes of his garments, people could touch and be of the kingdom. So we have to get good at reaching out our hand and grabbing hold of the kingdom and releasing the kingdom. The kingdom of God is at hand. Whose hand? Whose hands can touch the kingdom? Any hand. Young hand. Children had, The children would come and they'd say, oh, don't touch him. You're the children. He goes, no. Kingdom belongs to them. Little ch children's hands can touch him. Men's hands, women's hands. They're like, oh, he's talking, you know, that woman, he's like, no, the kingdom of God belongs to them. Jesus welcomed women. The kingdom is in their hands. The, the holy, the saints, yes, the king, but even the sinners. Remember people getting mad? F religious people said if Jesus knew who that woman was who's touching him, they were mad because she's touching him. But Jesus goes, don't you criticize her. The kingdom of God belongs to her. Her hands can touch me. Because if even if unclean hands touch the kingdom, they're made clean. Any hand that opens up. But if you sit like this, closed off, yeah, you can hear good words. 
You'll hear some words, but you'll be not changed by anything I say. If you, you, can, you can listen to beautiful worship. You'll be, it'll tickle your ears, but unless you stretch out your hands or open your hands, it's not going to change anything for you. Christianity, the kingdom of God, takes your hands, serving, loving, reaching, the hands of faith. The kingdom of God is a hand, not just ears, hands, action, not just words. Paul said the kingdom of God's not in word alone, it's in power. And so we need to see the king. That's revival, baby. That's revival. And then so after saying this, after Jesus said the kingdom of God with power, I want you to see six days later, he took them up a high mountain and he was transfigured. Revival is a mountaintop experience. And you and I need to have a mountaintop experience. Great moments. We need to sometimes, you know, stuff is tough. We live in the valley. We walk through valleys. It's not, you know, we don't just go from mountain to mountain. There's lots of valleys. And we have to walk through those valleys. And they're not always fun. The mountaintop is fun. But you have to get to the mountaintop again and again to make it through the valley. You know, even church is meant to be a mountaintop experience. You know, you should, be, you know, if they, they said, come up to the mountain of the Lord. Come, let us ascend to the hill of the Lord. The mountain of the church, the mountain of the house of the Lord will be exalted above all other mountains. And so we're meant to be this kingdom community that gathers and we have these, you know, in the midst of our brokenness and our struggles and the things we walk through in our valleys, we know what it is to leave. Those things will still be be there when you go home. All your, your hobbies or your struggles or your passions or your addictions, they'll be there. Leave them behind. Come up the mountain. Things change on the mountain. God does amazing things on the mountain, but you have to go up there. Sometimes I want people so much to experience it, I'd piggyback them up there if I could. But I realized Jesus said, no, I invite them, but they have to walk up it. James, Peter, and John have to walk up it. If you don't engage your feet, you know, I said engage your hands, but now you got to engage your feet. You got to come up the mountain. You got to you got to come up and worship. You got to take steps towards the Lord. But listen, mountaintop experiences will change you and it'll change the world. Elijah brought fire on the mountain. Moses received the law of God on the mountain. Christ was crucified on the mountain of Golgotha. I mean, mountains are these high places where God does high and holy things. Not so we can just stay there forever, which they wanted to do, but we encounter something more of God. We encounter something more. So I'm saying to you, even tonight, Jesus is calling you up the mountain. And, and you may have been up the mountain, but how high do you think this mountain goes? Do you think you, you, you've reached the heights? We've seen the, you know, yeah, we've been there. We've done that. Because this is what I think sometimes happens to Christians who get apathetic. We're like, yeah, we know that. Well, we've been saved. And yeah, we spoke in tongues. And yeah, we, we went to the conference. We got the t-shirt. I'm like, hey, that's awesome. But do you know there's so much more? I used to love exploring waterfalls. I'd go find, I'd go find rivers and waterfalls, and BC is filled with them. And I remember one, there was one I found, and my friend told me there was five more waterfalls up there. And we all began to go search these waterfalls. We found one, and it was astounding, and then we had to keep going up the mountain, and we found a second fall, and it was amazing. And then we, I, I wanted to keep going. I'm like, I heard there's more. I mean, they were really amazing, like natural water slides you could kind of shoot off and plunge into a great big pool of water. It was so amazing. And, uh, but sometime between the second falls and the third falls was a long walk. And uh, then people were like, oh, I don't even know. Are you sure there's even more? Are you sure there's another falls? Are you sure there's something higher up the mountain? And people want to go back, and they can just be satisfied being, you know, hey, I went to the first falls. I'm saved. That's cool. Maybe I went to the second falls. I'm like, yeah, I, I got saved. And also, I got filled with the Holy Spirit, and I spoke in tongues. And I'm good. I, I know Christianity. And I'm like, are you kidding me? Like the Apostle Paul, he, he like wrote two-thirds of the New Testament, saw Jesus in the flesh. You know, Peter saw people healed in a shadow. Pa Paul saw dead people raised. And you know what he said at the end of his life in Philippians? He goes, oh, I just wish I could know him. I'm like, what do you mean you just wish you could know him? Like, you know him. But the ones who know him know they don't know him. 
You know what I mean? The ones who've been there know there's more. And so no matter where you've been, whatever falls you visited, there's something that's amazing. What C.S. Lewis said about Narnia is the kingdom. It's always further, further, deeper, deeper, higher, higher. It's, you'll, all of heaven, you'll be exploring the endless wonders of this being called God. And you'll never find an end of the depths of the ocean. You'll never come to the end of the joy inexpressible. You'll never find the end of the peace that passes understanding. You'll never reach the end of his power. You will continue continually be amazed at this never-ending mountain top. There's more and more mountains. So I just want to put that in to say, to inspire you to go, there is more for all of us, to those who are hungry, to those who are thirsty, to those who are willing to walk after it, to climb the mountain. But it's hard work to climb mountains. And sometimes you got to help each other up and you encourage each other. Keep going after what God has for you. Keep going after what God has for your family. Keep going after what God has for your community. Keep going after what God has for your generation. Don't become complacently satisfied. There's a good satisfaction, a contentment, but that you're content but always hungering for more because you know there's more. So I want to encourage you, go up the mountain. Go find more. Go find the third falls and the fourth falls and the fifth falls. Ask yourself, how much of God can I know this side of heaven? Ask yourself, how much of his love could flow through me this side of heaven? How much of his power could, could rest on a human being this side of heaven? And just go after it. Just climb the mountain and ask Jesus to show you the kingdom of God with power. I say sometimes, you know, the kingdom, the power, that word is dynamis. It means dynamite. Like, sometimes we're like playing with firecrackers. You know, as a kid, we played with firecrackers. You know, and you'd, you'd get a bigger firecracker, and sometimes you'd be real brave, and you'd try and hold it, and it'd blow off in your hand, and your hands would sting, or you'd, you know, I don't know, that's what boys do, stuff like that. But, I mean, that, and sometimes charismatics are like that. Well, we have some little, you know, we blow off some fireworks. We go, oh, we had a powerful experience. And I'm like, okay, it was. But the dunamis of God, the real kingdom of God with power that fell on the day of Acts, I mean, it causes communities to be saved, 3,000 in a day. I mean, it raises the dead. I'm not saying I even know it. I've seen some powerful things, but I don't think I know his power. I'm like Paul. I've said, I want to know your power. And every little bit I taste, I know there's more. So I just want to inspire you. Go up the mountain. Embrace the fullness. No Jesus light. No kingdom light. And, and, and no Lego Jesus. What do I mean by that? No Lego Jesus. Well, it says up there his, his appearance changed because here's what, another thing I think that happens and why we lose interest and why religion kills revival. Because what religion does is it likes little parts and pieces of Jesus, but not all of Jesus. You see, his appearance changed. They knew him. They'd been with him for years. They go, whoa, I never saw that side of him before. His face changed. Whoa, I never saw that before. Because we sometimes just like, I like this side of Jesus. I like the, la the lamb. Look at him. He's nice. He's kind. And all of a sudden, he's like, his face turns. He's like, Phew. You're like, oh, whoa. He's a lion. I didn't know that. And then his face turns. He's like, you go, oh, he's a loving father. And then his face turns. He's like, oh, he's a wise teacher. And then his face turns. He's like, oh, he's a miracle worker. And religion will go, this side of Jesus, you know, Jesus the teacher and savior, but don't believe in the Jesus, the healer, or, you know, raise the dead, drive out demons. They'll want you to have a piece of Jesus. But I tell, you, I tell people, you can't pick and choose pieces of the gospel that you like and leave the other pieces and build your own Jesus. That's a Lego Jesus. Like, I'll take this piece and I'll just create my own little Jesus. And normally what happens when you begin to create your own Jesus is you begin to make him in your image. You see, Jesus wants to make you in his image, but you've got to see more of him to become more like him. Because the Jesus you see is the Christian you'll be. But what happens is we don't want to always change. We don't really always want to change. That's the problem because if he shows me more, he might change me. So I don't want to change. And so one of us has got to change, me or you. So I decided in religion we'll just change Jesus to make him more like us. So we'll make Jesus into our image. We'll make our, we'll make our church call. We'll make Jesus into our church's image. Rather than let the real Jesus loose and make him, let him make the church and us into his image. So don't have Jesus light. Don't do no Lego Jesus. Do the real Jesus. Allow him to show you things you've never seen before. And not just the parts you, that are your favorite verses, <laughs> but the parts that aren't even. You're like, okay, this part makes me uncomfortable. I'll be honest. I'm like, Jesus, I don't, I don't know if I like this guy who tips tables all the time. Like, what if I don't want you to tip my table? But, but, I, but I'm like, you're the Lord. You can be whoever you want. So allow Jesus to show you more. Let's embrace the fullness. There's a word that began to haunt me, and it was that phrase, that Jesus, I remember I was in a prayer meeting, and I heard him speak it to me, and it began to haunt me all the time. And it was just a simple phrase, embrace my fullness. 
He didn't say understand it because I could never understand it. Not even, I couldn't even contain it. He didn't say contain it. He said embrace it. Embrace my fullness. Not just your favorite parts. Not just a little part. Not this, you know, I like his love, but I don't like his holiness. You know, I like his friendship, but I don't like the fear of the Lord. I like him to be my savior, but I don't really want him to be my Lord. You know, no, he's like, embrace my fullness. I'll save you, I'll forgive you. It'll be a process. He's not demanding me to be perfect. It was a process for them. They were still messing up after they went up the mountain. But don't stop allowing Jesus to lead you and change you and show you more. And listen, if you do that, I'm telling you, the things you try and struggle with to change, when you stop trying and stop just looking, start looking at Jesus and let him do whatever he wants, as he, you allow him to show you things, he will transform you because you're beholding him. But that happens up the mountain, baby. So you got to come up that mountain. Now, I could talk about this, and you could be like the, the Israel who said, hey, Moses, you go up the mountain for us. You go talk to God, and you come down and tell us what he said, because we don't want to go up the mountain. It's a long walk, plus there's a lot of smoke and fire on that mountain, and that looks a little dangerous. And so they sat down there, and Moses said, okay, I'll go up the mountain. And he goes up there for 40 days and he comes down and his face is glowing like Jesus' face. It's glowing. And they're like, he had to actually put something over his face because it was too bright to look at. Like, that would be awesome if at some point I'm preaching and people are like, I can't look at you? I mean, that's amazing. But it wasn't, it didn't happen because Moses was like, oh, I'm going to try and shine brighter. Make me shine. You know, it doesn't come by striving. It, it came, he didn't probably, he didn't even know his face was shining, I don't think, until he came down because he'd just been up there. In the, in the presence of God. And if you're going to be with God, you're going to start to become like God. When you've been with power, you don't even realize what power begins to be on you. I remember when God took me up a mountain this one time, and uh, I experienced the power of God so powerful fell on me, and I didn't even know what to do with it. I'm just uh, shaking. I didn't, and, and he's, I said, what do I do? He said, just go put your hands on your, I was a youth pastor, put your hands on youth, so I just began to put my hands on youth, and, rev and healings, and deliverances, and revival began to break out, now it didn't happen because I was like trying, mm, mm, just striving to do this for God, no, it's, it happened because I've been with God, you got to go up the mountain, you got to go, and not the worship leaders can lead you there, but if you just watch them go up the mountain, hey, that's cool. Go up the mountain first, Moses. Sing some songs first. Tell God we're, we're cool down here. Chuck us down a couple of good blessings. <laughs> and, you know, tell him we'll see him next Sunday. <laughs> but no, like, you got to go up that mountain and be with him yourself. And what happens is you'll come home into your family, into your community, and, and they'll go, wow, you look different. What's different? And you, you, you won't even know because you weren't even trying to be different. You see, we're all trying to change, but we can't change. You're changed from being with him and looking at him. That's what changes you. And so come up the mountain. And uh, by the way, so this is about revival. This is what revival is. And so then they almost, so then they had that. They saw that. They go, this is awesome. And then they, go, but they got the, they got the vision of revival wrong. They thought the vision is like, let's build more tabernacles. You know, L let's, uh, l let's put our business cards out. We'll call it Transfiguration Ministries. And we'll, you know, <laughs> and we'll just like, it'll be amazing. You know, and, and we'll like, hey, Moses and Elijah, this will be awesome. And they had all their ideas. And we bring all our ideas. This is just what we do. We just bring all our ideas. And, 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 and uh, the father's like, no, no, no. See, this guy's Jesus. He's leading this. You just got to listen to him. And that, sometimes, you know why we lose it? Because we lose the simplicity. People hear that and they go, that's, Nolan, what you're saying is so simple. I, I've heard, I'm like, okay, you've heard it, but are you doing it? You know, it's because Paul said to the Corinthian church, he said, I'm worried about you. You guys are losing the simplicity of devotion to Jesus. That this is Jesus. Follow him. You know what Christianity is? This is Jesus. Follow him. Not follow Moses, not follow Elijah, not follow me. I tell people too, I'm not called to make disciples of me. I'm called to make disciples of the Christ. This is Jesus. Follow him. That's the message. This is Jesus. Follow him. This is Jesus. Do whatever he tells you to do. This is Jesus. This is like, this is God. This is the fullness of the Godhead in bodily form. This is Jesus who bled for you. This is Jesus. That's the message of revival. And everything in this thing has to reveal Jesus. And if it doesn't, it's off and it's wrong. You know why we want to have the fruit of the Spirit? Because it reveals Jesus. 
Love reveals Jesus. Joy reveals Jesus. Peace reveals Jesus. You know what the scriptures are meant to be? Not to inform you to make you wise. The Pharisees, Jesus said, you guys understand the scriptures. You read them, but he goes, it doesn't do anything for you because they're all point to me and you refuse to come to me. Scripture won't do anything for you if it doesn't point you to Jesus. Moses and Elijah won't do nothing for you if it doesn't point you to Jesus. Church won't do anything for you if it doesn't point you to Jesus. Worship won't do anything for you if it doesn't point you to Jesus. My preaching tonight won't do anything for you unless it reveals something more of Jesus to you. That's it. And, and we need the Holy Spirit to do that because flesh and blood can't reveal him. But Jesus must be revealed. Every leader, Moses and Elijah, are awesome. But what are they doing? They're pointing to Jesus. John the Baptist, the greatest leader, such a great leader. Jesus said, no one like him born of a woman. You know how great he was? People thought he was the Christ. They go, are you the Christ? And he goes, no, I'm not the Christ. I'm just a voice. And he said, don't follow me. Follow Jesus. I've got to become less. He's got to become more. All powerful, anointed leadership should be helping you to be consumed with Jesus because I don't want another Moses revival or Elijah revival or Nolan revival or any other name revival. I want a Jesus movement. I want a Jesus revival. I want to see Jesus high and lifted up. He's the one who has all authority in heaven and earth. I want to see Jesus set the captives free. I want my children to meet Jesus. I want them to come to Jesus. Listen, yes, I want them to come to church. Yes, I want them to come to conferences, but I want them to come there because Jesus is in our midst and they can see Jesus. Church is the community where two or three gather around me in my name. If Jesus is in the midst of you, that's what makes church, church, Jesus. If Jesus isn't here, it's nothing. It's nothing. That's what Moses said. He goes, if your presence doesn't go with us, you know, we don't even want to go. We shouldn't even do any of this. We shouldn't even, do, I, you know, yeah, we can have good music. The world has great music. Yeah, we can have good speakers. I go on TED Talks. They're great speakers. I need Jesus to come through me. I, I want you at the end of the day, this is my hope as a minister, that people say, man, he's, if, if you say I'm passionate, that's great. If it, it's inspiring, that's great. If it's like, wow, he's intelligent, that's great. But that's not really what I want. I want them to go, man, I saw something more of Jesus. Jesus. He helped me see Jesus. He helped bring me closer to Jesus. He helped me touch Jesus because if Jesus doesn't go with us, none of this matters and revival will all fade away and die because we lost Jesus. And that's what happens to revival. So don't lose Jesus. I know it's simple, but I'm telling you, if you write this down in your heart and mind, it'll transform you, your lives, and your churches. It's all about Jesus. Okay, one last thing and then we're going to pray. They wanted to stay up there in the mountain. And we, you know, when we do experience revival, sometimes we also get it wrong. The reason for, why do we want more power? So I can go look, and so people can go like, man, Nolan's powerful? I go, yeah, I feel powerful. Ah, oh, wow. I want more power so I can be like, wow, we're powerful. No. So we can stay up there in the power. Why did, why did, why did Jesus said to the early church, wait in the upper room for power to come on you? Why? So you can be like, we're powerful. No. Because you can be my witnesses in the valley. We go to the mountain because people in the valley need power. We, we come to the house of the Lord because we need his power to touch us. But then we go back into our valleys, to our workplaces, to our homes, into our brokenness of our lives, into our children. And we can bring something of the power of God, of the power of his love, of his grace, of his peace into the valley. Jesus said, no, we're not staying up here. Because at the valley below, when you, if you read the next part, which I won't go there right now, there's a, a father with a boy who's being destroyed by demonic powers. And the church, you can read it. Well, I'll read it to you real quickly. Because it's really important. And this is uh, further down Mark chapter 9. I want you to hear this. This is the reason. We want to go up the mountain to touch more power. And then we want to go into our lives and into our communities. And we want to walk it out with a greater measure of power. Listen, if you are not, you know, your phone dies if you don't plug it in. It loses power. You will lose power. You will lose power. If you're not continually being filled with the Spirit, you will lose power. And the reason is because you're not plugging in. You're not stretching out your hand. Hey, man, there's power in the plugins, but if you're not plugging in, it's, it's not going to work. There's not a lack of power in God. There's no lack of power in the Holy Spirit. The, the lack is that we don't stretch out our hand and touch it. <laughs> She's awesome. This is what the power of God's for the children. And that's such a nice dress. Um, so, verse 9, they were coming down the mountain. And, and so we're going to jump down to... Uh, 
Verse 14, so they come down the mountain. This is, why we, this is why we want revival. Because if we lose the purpose, I believe God goes, you missed it. The cloud, I'm going to lift my cloud off you. You lost the purpose. You can still keep playing church, <laughs> but now nah, you're missing it. And the cloud will lift and the power will fade. And that's what happens because we start thinking it's about us or it's about Moses and Elijah and it's about how great we are. And isn't our church more powerful? And isn't our service more powerful? And, 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 we, and we lose what it's about. We lose Jesus and we lose the fact that it's about all the people who, don't, who aren't in this building. It's about, it's, about the, it's about when I was youth pastoring, it's about kids who are struggling with suicide. It's about people who have addictions that they can't beat. And, and that counselors can't help them, and pastors can't help them, and I can't help them. It's about my kid fighting darkness that I can't beat for him. I'd, I'd love to, but I know he needs the power of God. And if I am going to help him, I've got to go find some greater power that I can bring back down into the valley of his life. That's what it's about. I want power because I love people. I want the kingdom of God with power because I love people. I want the kingdom of God to be on earth because that's where the people are, on earth. You know, it should be great to go up to heaven, but Paul said it's better that I stay down here and help you because it's about people. It's about your neighbors. It's about the hurting. It's about broken. It's about this. Uh, look, at, look what happens in the valley. When they, they came down, they saw a great crowd around the disciples and religious scribes arguing with them. By the way, the religious spirit's greater argument, not greater power, and not greater helping people. Whenever you see religious strife, whenever you lose the kingdom and you lose Jesus, and you lose the mission, and all you got is religion and tabernacles, you'll end up with only arguments and religious strife. Immediately all the crowds, when they saw him, they were greatly amazed. They ran up to greet him, and he asked them, what are you arguing about? And someone from the crowd, listen to what he said. He said, teacher, I brought my son. Now I want you to hear this. Any parents here? You know what broke my heart more than anything? was seeing my kids struggle with something. Some of the darkness that I went through, I was like, okay, I, I knew I was about to walk through something dark. My prayer was, God, just keep my kids. I'll walk through hell. I'll carry whatever cross I gotta carry. I'll pay whatever price. But Lord, just help my kids. Because the greatest struggle is to see someone you love hurt and feel powerless. And that's this dad. I want you to feel this. So this dad says, my son, I brought my son my son, my daughter, someone I love. I brought my son, for there's a spirit that attacks him, and whenever it seizes him, it throws him down. A demonic power hurting your kid. A demonic power hurting someone you love. An unseen force. People are battling demons. And, and you know, we always get weirded out when we say demons. You picture, like, you know, the exorcist or someone's head spinning. No, just, like, Dark forces, your demons might be addiction, your demons might be self-hatred, your demons might be despair. We're all fighting our demons. But this man, his heart's broken for his kid. He has a spirit that's seizing him, throwing him down, it foams, grinds his teeth. I asked your disciples to cast it out, they weren't able. This is why we need power. Because we don't, we're not able to help the hurting. We're not able to set the captives free because we don't have the power. We're not able to heal the brokenhearted because we don't have the power of Jesus flowing through us. And if they can admit that Jesus' first disciples weren't able because they didn't have power, then come on, can we have the humility to admit we need more power? I'll have the humility to admit I don't have the power that I need to help the people I want to help. And that's why I come here. And that's why I get on my knees. I'm like, oh, meet with me. And, you know, meet with me so I can overcome my demons that I'm fighting. But put power on me so I can go help my children and other people's children. And whether I help one or 1,000 or 1 million, I just want to help people on this earth in this mission. I want to help bring some power to them. Some power of hope. Some power of love. Some power of peace in their storms that they feel like they're tormented by anxiety. Some power of love in their loneliness that they feel rejected. Some power of healing in their hurts and their brokenness. And not just the hurts that we see in their bodies. I, yes, I want to see physical bodies healed. But I become more obsessed with seeing people's inner brokenness healed. Because the Bible says you can, a broken body you can endure, but who can endure a broken spirit? And there's broken people everywhere. And I walked through brokenness, and I felt it. And I'm like, this is the most horrible feeling. And it, like, it felt like it wanted to destroy me. I'm like, oh, this is what some people feel who walk through divorce, who walk through brokenness, who've been rejected, who've been torn or slandered or they're being attacked. I'm like, this is how it feels. And I'll tell you, even the most broken things that I went through, it put in me a greater compassion for broken people to go, oh, let me bring the power of your love to a broken generation. 
They were not able, and we're sometimes we're not able. And Jesus said, oh, faithless generation, how long am I to be with you? How long am I to bear with you? Bring him to me. Bring him where? Bring him to church? Again, I'm not bashful. Yes, bring him, no, but it, bring him to me. Bring him to me. Bring him to your favorite speaker? Yeah, because they might help. But only if that speaker is helping, bring them to Jesus. Jesus said, bring them to me. Jesus said, bring your sins to me. Don't hide them. I'm the one who takes away the sins of the world. Bring your sins to me. Bring your fears to me. Bring your brokenness to me. I'll make something beautiful. Bring it to me. Please bring the thing that you're most shamed of. Don't you think this man felt shamed? I can't even help my son. You know how shamed you feel when you can't help someone? Don't think these disciples felt shamed? We weren't able. We tried. Oh, we just feel discouraged. Get past that. We aren't able. Make peace with the fact that you're not able. But he's able. Jesus says, bring them to me. Bring them to me. Bring these children. Bring these broken ones. Bring these hurting ones. Bring them to me. Not just the idea of me, but the real being of me. Bring them to me. I'll heal him. And they brought the boy to him. And when the spirit saw him, it convulsed. And he fell on the ground and rolled about, foaming in his mouth. And Jesus asked his father, how long has this been happening to him? He said, from childhood. Oh, aren't those some of the hardest when you've had to live with your demons for a long time and you've been hurt and thrown down? Or you see, you know, and so sometimes we give up hope, right? We tried. We weren't able. We tried to bring change. We weren't able. We tried to change our bring heal our families, we weren't able. We tried to change our cultures, we weren't able. And we aren't able. We aren't the great hope. We aren't the great power of God. Jesus is. Bring them to me. And so the man said, but if you can do anything, Jesus, nobody else could. I couldn't as a dad. And you don't think he tried? You could, you could hear the dad's heart. He loves him. I can't do anything. No one can help him. So, but Jesus, if you can, have compassion on us and save us. And it is his compassion that healed. This is compassion that drove him to the valley. It's his compassion that drove him to the cross. Because he came for broken people. He, he has compassion. This is what happened through my brokenness. I think every, people who would have heard me before would have said, probably if I could sum up Nolan's ministry, it would be passion. And I, I'd speak about passion for Jesus. And I am about passion for Jesus. I want to be passionate. I, st I think I still am passionate. But when I walked through brokenness, you know what went into me? compassion which if you, if, you're, if you don't have compassion with your passion it won't help anybody it'll be like oh that's cool he's inspiring but it's not gonna compassion moves you to go touch that person and help that person and cry with that person and if you have to lay down over top of that person like Elijah if you have to weep over that person if you have to like compassion move Jesus if you can do anything have compassion on us and help us and Jesus said to him if you can <laughs> say what if you can, did you just say what I think you said? <laughs> like, Jesus doesn't get offended very much, but he's like, whoa, whoa, hold up. Did you just say, if you can? <laughs> did you put some limit on my power? You put the if in the wrong place. And I understand he said, other people have failed you, so you've lost hope. And you feel like you failed, so you've lost hope. And maybe even the church has failed you, and it's not pointing fingers at the church. This is the best of the church. This is the best. The best apostles couldn't help him. All of Jesus' best disciples couldn't help him. It's not us. Bring him to me. If you can, all things are possible for him who believes. Immediately the father cried out. And by the way, it's not perfect. He says, I do believe. Help overcome my unbelief. You don't have to be perfect in your faith, but you got to believe. Because if you don't believe, you won't be able to, t to touch his power. And bring it. And if you don't have compassion, you won't touch people. And this is the two things you need. That faith that touches God's power and that compassion that touches the hurting. And we need to have a hand on the kingdom of heaven and a hand on earth where the broken are. We need to be touching the kingdom of heaven and we need to be touching the earth. I tell people the kingdom is heavenly and it's earthly. And if you get so heavenly, you're about up in your heavenly experiences, but it's not touching people in the earth. If it's not touching people in the dirt, if it's not touching people in the brokenness, if it's not helping people who are struggling right down here, then you're, you're, it, we're not representing Jesus. Because Jesus was heavenly, but he took on flesh to help flesh, to help real people with real struggles and real pains. All things are possible for one who believes. The question is not if he can, is this. If we can believe, 
in the midst of our disappointment, in the midst of our pain, even though you've, you've had this for a long time, can you still believe that Jesus can help you? Even though you've been disappointed, and even though sometimes you've waited 38 years like the man at the pool, and you haven't got better, can you still believe that Christ won't forget you, that he will come to you? If you can you just believe? And the Father said, I do believe. Help my unbelief. And Jesus rebuked the unclean spirit, saying, never, I love this, never enter him again. Didn't just say leave him for a bit. Don't you ever come back and hurt this kid again. The, you, know, you know the fierceness of a father's heart? Someone hurts my kid, and I'm like, L listen, I'm a, I'm a good, I'm a, I'm a, I tell you I'm a fighter because I'm a lover. But if you touch my kid, I, I feel like I want to destroy people. And there's a godly side of that. Yes, I can forgive, but I'm telling you, I will, I will lay down my life to protect my kid, but I'll t I, if need be, if need be, because this is on tape, if need be, I, I take someone's life to save my child. That, that's a strong statement, but if someone's coming to take my child's life, that ain't gonna happen. And people go, whoa, 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 what, what do you mean? Listen, Jesus said this. You know when Jesus got the most fierce? You know the most fierce thing Jesus ever said? This is letters in red. He sounded like the Godfather in this when he said this. He said, I just want you to know, if you ever hurt one of my little children, you're better off to tie a cement millstone around your neck and throw yourself into the sea. That's straight out of the Godfather. That's like cement boots. He goes, don't touch my kids. You know the most fierce display of God's wrath in the Old Testament? Or th there's numbers, but one was when he uh, destroyed Pharaoh and Egypt. Remember that? He destroyed that. You know why he did it? He said, Israel is my firstborn son. Let him go. Someone had kidnapped his kids. Someone was torturing his kids, hurting his kids. And, and he's like, and he said, listen, I'm trying to be nice to you, Pharaoh. Just let him go. But if you don't let him go, if you don't listen to my words, I'll take my fist and crush you because those are my kids. And he gave him 10 warnings. He's patient. But let me tell you something. It is a dangerous, dangerous thing to touch God's children because he's a fierce father and he's not weak. He's forgiving and he forgives us and he forgives others and he tells us to love our enemies. But, I, but he also has a fierce side. He is the most gentle. There's no paradox in that for me. I'm okay with divine tensions. I'm okay with lay down my life, love my enemies, transform them. But I'm also okay with the other side of Jesus that says if you hurt my kids, I'll throw you in the sea. <laughs> Don't hurt my kids. And so Christ has this passion. And he's like to this demonic power, which is what our real battle is against. It's not people. The, the enemies that are hurting our kids are the unseen forces. And, uh, and Jesus is like to this spirit. He's like, don't you ever touch this kid again. I love that. I want to grab the like rod of God that Moses had and I want to go to these pharaohs, whether they're suicide spirits or addictive spirits or self -hate. and I want to go with authority of God, not in my name, but in the, like Moses, what in the name of the great I am. And I want to say, hey Pharaoh, hey Satan, hey whatever spirits you are, whatever powers, whatever principalities, I come in a greater name and I want you to hear me. Let my children go. Let my people go. But I need the power of Christ to do that because it's not my name and it's not my power and it's not even my courage to do that. I don't want to go, Moses didn't want to go confront the greatest power on earth, Pharaoh. It's God's power. That's why we need it for these kids. And so the spirit, after crying out, convulsing him terribly, it came out and the boy was given back. Jesus took him by the hand, lifted him up and gave him back to his father. That's revival. So would we go all the way up the mountain to touch power just for one kid? What would you do to help one kid? I know what I would do because when it was my kid, I'm like, I'll do anything, God. How do I bring your power to my kid? I'll know what, I, I'll, know what I'll do for one of my kids. And, and I felt like Christ said, even when I, what you went through, Nolan, I've seen Christ break through and start to touch my kids in amazing ways and, went, and, and uh, start to set them free. But I had to go up and touch his power and begin to keep calling his kingdom. Let your kingdom come to my kids. Let your power, and he doesn't even need me to touch my kids. My, one of my kids was struggling the most. I, I looked, one time he, he came to me, I looked over, and the power of God just fell on him, and, and he's just like, just, t just, tr just changed. I'm like, oh, I've been trying so hard. I felt like the Father was trying so hard to help him, and I realized, God, you just did it. That's why we want the power of God. Whew. All right, let's stand up. Oh, whew. <laughs> oh boy. Yes, Lord.
let us suffer. I don't know what you guys have, but if you feel anything. <laughs> but I, listen, I think what we should do tonight is we should climb up the mountain of worship because I don't got the power to give it to you. I need to go up the mountain. Come, let us go up to the mountain of the hill of the Lord. And let's meet with him. And let's be set free ourselves so that we can take freedom into the valley of our own lives because free people, free people. And healed people heal people. And listen, there's no shame where you feel weak. I don't want to shame one person here. His power is made perfect in your weakness. You don't, I'm not telling you to be powerful. I'm telling you to take your weakness and your brokenness and whatever demons oppress you and hurt you. Jesus doesn't demonize people. He delivers people. He doesn't shame the father. He doesn't shame the boy. He doesn't go, why are you struggling with this demon? Why don't you just get over it? He just sets him free. And he'll set you free. He will set you free. He can set you free. But we're going to have to go up the mountain, and we're going to have to stretch out our hands because the kingdom of God's hand, we're going to have to touch his power. And, 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 let's, and let's let it be about Jesus. And then, listen, if we touch power and we're transformed, but make it your mission, even in this year, even if each of us, you know, sometimes we go, and I want to see the thousands, but even if it's one person, if you help heal one person, love one person, free one person, show kindness to one person. That, you know, Jesus took them all the way up the mountain, gave them the most powerful encounter just for one boy and one dad. Come on, that's revival. <laughs> Can we lift our hands up to the Lord? I love you, little Violet. It's for her and her generation. Let me just move my glasses. I'm all scared I'm going to break these glasses. Oh, man. All right, my friends. I'm going to go up with you. I'm just kind of trying to be a tour guide. Let's go. Let's climb this mountain. Let's lift our hands up. To, oh. <laughs> Jesus. Jesus, take us up the mountain tonight. Only you can take us there. You took James and Peter and John. They had to go with you. We want to climb with you. We want to see the kingdom of God with power, God. God, we need your power to help us. We need your power to heal us. We need your power to forgive us, to free us, and our children, and our neighbors, and our generation. I got nothing else to say. I'm going to put this down. And... Uh, I just point the way, and they're going to they're gonna begin to worship. And I, I just want you to come up the mountain. And if you want to lay down, if you want to stand up, if you want to kneel, if you want to come up, I'd climb the mountain and touch the power. The kingdom of God's at hand. Use your feet and go after him. And if you're not doing it for yourself, do it for one other person. Come on, come on, come on. Come on, Jesus, we need your power. Go in that room. 
Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Shalom, can you just lift your hands up again? Lift your hands. And I just, uh, I just saw two things. You know, I just th this the cloud of glory that came down. And I feel like you know we need uh, that that cloud to come and rest in us, because there's a cloud of darkness in the world, and there's a a, a cloud of the enemy. But God wants to bring us to that cloud of glory. And, and the other thing, you know, he only asked for one thing from that father. He just said, just believe. And, uh, and, and the man said, help me overcome my unbelief. I do believe. And I feel like Christ wants to just take away some unbelief right now uh, to do with your family, to do with your children, to do with your struggles. Can you imagine this dad? facing something and just hoping and believing but what like could he really believe like he had hope maybe but it was hard for him to believe because he'd been disappointed and many of us have been and I just feel like Christ wants to lift uh, any heaviness or unbelief or disappointment and he's so gracious the man just said help me and Jesus lifted it so can we lift our hands if you want some help God we just ask you to uh, take away any unbelief we do believe you said all things are possible, all things. For the one who believes, all things, all. Not some things, not even most things, all things. God, help me to truly believe that all things are possible. Help me to truly believe and help me overcome my unbelief. Help me overcome my darkness. Help me believe for me, but help me believe for my children. Help me believe for my church and my neighbor. And Jesus, we just need you. And we just need Jesus so bad. And we need your cloud and your glory. And we need your power. We need a Jesus revival so bad. We don't need just more churches. We just need Jesus to transform our nation. We need you, Jesus. We need you, Jesus. So tonight, would you take us there? Would your cloud just come and fill our worship as we climb this mountain? And would you take away, God, those things that stand in the way? Just let them take away your unbelief. I just feel them rolling away uh, disappointment and unbelief. And I want to tell you, he's not disappointed with you. He's not shaming you. He's not shaming the Father. He didn't shame the church and say, oh, you know, he just, bring it to me. Bring the boy, and I want you, if you've not, it's the hardest thing. Someone you care about, you, you hang on to so hard. Like, I had the hardest time to give my children to Jesus because I was like, do I trust you? Like, are you going to help them? And it was hard because I was like, I got to do it. I got to fix this. And it, it's hard as parents. It's hard as parents. But if Jesus doesn't reach this generation, nothing will do. So I want you just to... Bring, bring what it is that troubles you. Bring what it is that hurts you. Bring what it is that, that causes fear or anxiety. Just bring it and just, just bring it to him. Just bring it to him. Just lay it down there. Your sin, your hurts, your fears, your anxieties, the ones you love, your friends, the ones you're most worried about because we all know someone who's struggling with something. We all have our own struggles. And I, I just come in your honesty. Come in your authenticity. And... Uh, and I believe that just with he will set you free. So let's just give him that.
we wait upon you. We wait for your power. They that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength as the eagles. We wait upon you. Wait for your fire to purify our hearts and burn away the dross in us. We wait upon you. We wait for your prayer. in the presence of the Lord there's fullness of joy and we wait we wait upon you we wait for the moment when the spirit of the Lord comes and fills his house with his grace And so, Lord, come, yeah. oh, come. Even so, Lord, come, oh, come. Even so, Lord.
Yeah, Jesus. You know, there's uh, something really beautiful about coming up the mountain, but also just to know that Jesus goes with you, you know, into the valleys and into places. Um, he is the God who's with us. <coughs> and he'll go with you into your homes, and he'll go with you as you go to pray for your children. And but I, I, I do feel like there's people I'm supposed to pray for tonight. And, um, <coughs> you know, I, I'm, I'm, just, uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm just like you. I need, a I need a touch of his power. But I know sometimes his power can rest uh, on, on us. But I, I just know there's, um, there's always more. And uh, so whatever you have need of, spirit, soul, or body, I just feel like he wants to heal, you know, and free. And uh, he's the only one who can do it, but he does use us. And um, so if, if, if some of you have to go, I always want to be sensitive and know that there might be, but, but I, we're going to worship and we're going to climb, but I feel like I'm supposed to pray for some uh, um, some people, and you may have been prayed for like a hundred times. You know, I'm sure this father tried to get his son healed a uh, hundred times. And, uh, and G Jesus just loves that faith and that hope that doesn't give up. Um, so I, I want to climb the mountain with you, you know. I'm just so hungry. I stirred myself into hunger. <laughs> um, but I, I, wa I want to pray for some who are hurting. And I just feel the compassion of Christ uh, for you. And so if, if you want prayer and you're at the front, I'm just going to, as Christ leads me, I pray for you as they continue to minister and, 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 uh, and worship. And, but this is m more than just a night. This is more than just a weekend. We, we, we want you to come back tomorrow and morning and night. And let's just keep ascending that mountain for ourselves and for our children or for the next generation. Uh, for us. <laughs> Because we, we need it. I need it. But may he fill more than our... It's not just... It, he loves churches. But he doesn't just stay in tabernacles. <laughs> he goes down into our homes and into our restaurants and our, our bedrooms. And I just pray you'd go our stay or whatever you do with a greater sense of his presence and uh, his power with you. And... Um, my, my compassion I can feel uh, for some people in here, and I, I don't need to know what it is you're struggling with. Uh, I, I don't need to know. Uh, and and uh, I'm just going to help, you know, bring you to Jesus in my prayers and add my faith to your faith. And, uh, of course, he can meet you. His cloud could fall on you anywhere, and he sure doesn't need my hand. <laughs> His hand's a lot bigger than mine, but... Uh, if you feel like you'd like prayer uh, at any time, if you come up or you're just sitting here, I just may w walk around as the Lord just leads me and, and pray and uh, just bless you. But whatever you guys feel, you know, I I'm, <laughs> I'm just looking for it too. I'm just dreaming of it. I want that cloud so bad. <laughs> uh, and... and uh, you know, and, and even as you're praying here right now, I really believe this. You know, um, he can heal your children, even if they're not here. You know, remember that man who came to Jesus and he said, you don't even have to come into my roof. You could just speak a word. Just exercise some faith today uh, for someone else. Just say, you know, just, just, you can come and stand for yourself or you can come and, stand for a, a loved one or child or grandchild or because um, that's you know th those are the those are the hardest things those are the greatest fears I'm sh th that we know when we see our kids suffer so uh, I'm someone who knows a little bit of that too uh, but I want to stand with you and pray with you so I'm going to put this down and I'm just going to move and pray as they continue to worship and whatever you guys feel trust you From the raging of the sun Where is that? Can Fire you on the altar Stoke the purity of love The red 
rhythm of angels And we'll be dancing in the street We'll sing the melodies of heaven Death, our death was slain. Through your life, our life is glory. With the authority of love, tells a whole different story. We'll be dancing in the street. We'll sing the melody. Heaven. Praise the song of the redeemed as we 
the purity of love to the rhythm of angels we'll be dancing in the street we'll sing the melodies of heaven we'll raise the song your feet